this sermon by saying this, we must never give up meeting together. Never. Allow the enemy through technology, schedule, or anything else cause us to give up meeting together. Nothing takes the place of our meeting together. Oh, I cannot emphasize, although I will try, the importance of our regularly meeting together. In fact, our meeting together is vital to our very survival. The quickest way for Satan to rob a believer of their fire, their joy, and yes, even their salvation is to convince that believer to forsake our meeting together. My pastor used to put it this way. You can take a hot piece of coal. For those who remember a coal fire. And take it out of the fire. And the coal can be red hot. But if you set that coal out to itself. And leave it there long enough. That red hot coal will cool off. It happens one to a hundred times out of a hundred. A thousand times out of a thousand. You cannot let the enemy convince you or cause you to fail to see how vital it is for the believers to meet together. Amen. Lastly, it is the will of God that we meet together. Why do you think Satan is busy scheduling more and more things on Sunday morning. There was a time when no NFL show, no sporting event, none of these things uh, would perform or have a show on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. There was a time when all stores and businesses closed. You couldn't, you couldn't go to the dr drugstore. You couldn't go to the mall. You couldn't do any of these things on Sunday. Look at what the enemy has done. One of the things that, that greatly challenges me, my brothers, that, that, that bothers me about black men, is the unease and the unrest that brothers seem to have when it comes to church. You can go to a club and you'll party all night. You can go to a game, a game, and sit there and cheer. You can go to some crack house and stay there, some whole house and stay there. We can watch a movie, watch three in a day. But it seems to me, when it comes to church, and I feel sorry for our women, I said in our 8 o'clock class today, many women have married men who are not churchgoers. She's sitting there trying to go to church. He's, a, he, he's sitting there, I got to go. We got to leave here. But if, we, but if you were at the OJ's concert, well, that's my day. Uh, tell me somebody new. Who? Drake. Uh, there you go, right at home. What has happened to us, young brother? Why do you not value your soul? 
Men, I want you to meet me Tuesday night. Every man should want the woman he loves, the children he's sired, the girlfriend he's dating, or whatever the case may be, every man should want that, those people to be right with God. There is something missing in your love or in your intelligence or in your psyche that you don't care if your girlfriend, if you're not married, your wife or your children go to hell. There's something wrong with you. Why are you jumping on the men? We're the head. That's, that's part of the problem right now. We're the head. She could, she, could, she could come to church and shout and dance until she hooked up with you. She could pay tithe until she hooked up with you. She could praise the Lord and wave her hand until she hooked up with you. When you should be the spiritual leader. It's amazing how we love to lead in things and in areas that are inconsequential. You know, all, you know exactly who's playing today. You know all the stats on uh, Rogers, uh, uh, Brady. You know about the uh, Steelers and Atlanta. Praise the Lord. You know what LeBron is doing right now? Right now. But when it comes to things that matter, because, see, you can know all that you know, but if you die and go to hell, you're going to be in hell forever. I think we ought to work to get first things first. Now, now that speaks to manhood. That woman right there, I want her to spend eternity in heaven. I don't want her to go to hell because I led her astray. I have children, I have grandchildren. If she don't make it, I don't want to be because I did it. And I'll tell you something else. If he can't lead you spiritually, lady, he can't lead you at all. Doesn't matter to me how big, how strong, how tall, how short. Doesn't matter how much money he has. No matter how articulate. It starts with spirituality. What are you going to do if you get sick? Who's going to pray for you? Find cancer in you. You, don't even think, you know you can't call on your husband because he wouldn't know how to pray. So honey, find the 23rd Psalm. Three hours later, he's still trying to find. Why? What has happened to us? Black man, you're not ashamed. My wife has never, we've been married 36 years. She's never Encourage me to attend church. Come on, honey. Are you going? Are you, you know, it's Sunday. You know, you know, well, you know. My argument has never been, well, I'm a man just like the pastor is. I put my pants on one leg at a time like he does. But we're not talking about donning clothes. We're talking about going to church. We're not talking about manhood. We're talking about coming before the God of the Bible. The God who made everything. All of the civil rights leaders who accomplished anything, the overwhelming majority, let me rephrase it, were churchgoers. You call Dr. King, Dr. King, all you want to. He was Reverend Doctor. He was a preacher. Abernathy, all of them. Those are preachers out there. The church led. And those, they, they didn't suffer what they suffered. They put up what they, with what they put up with for us to become spiritual invalids. Every man. Every man ought to take pride in seeing to it that his family meets God on time. 
Every man. Every man. Brother, you can get mad and never come back, but you ain't you gonna hear my voice from now on. You can't smoke it away, you can't drink it away, you can't fight it away. It's the truth. Someone said this. To neglect Christian meetings is to give up the encouragement and help of other Christians. We gather together to share our faith and strengthen and to strengthen one another in the Lord. This is why we have church. All these other things that we're bringing in. We come together to share our faith and to strengthen each other in the Lord as we get closer to the day. When Christ returns, we will face many spiritual struggles and even times of great persecution. Times are changing as we get closer. Amen. Anti-Christian forces will grow in strength. We see it now. Millions of women yesterday marching. You know what they were marching for? Abortion. Women teamed up with homosexuals. You, and, and you know, I told you I'm a prophet. I told you, everybody can't take me, but I told you that this outrage that everybody said they had, when they played that tape of Donald Trump on the bus talking, and he used the slang for the female reproductive organ. All that outrage, I told you that that was fake outrage. Now, the women proved that I was right yesterday because mothers voluntarily took their children to marches where people were marching with signs, dropping the F-bomb. They were cussing and swearing. Women walking around disguised as vaginas and just cussing and carrying on, and mothers brought their children to that march. Now, where was the outrage then? No mother tried to hide their children's eyes. No mother tried to, 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 to cover their ears. They brought the children to this swearing, cussing gathering. And notice the strange bedfellows. You got homosexuals and uh, abortionists. And it brought to my mind, ladies, this is why you're so important. You know, I, I, I kind of got the guys. But it, now, fellas, you, you weren't standing up when I was giving you instructions just a few minutes ago. Look at all these guys now. Y'all all right, but I just, I couldn't help but notice it. You know, when I, when I was talking to you, I mean, maybe they were standing behind me, but they sure were <laughs> Don't sit down, guys. I love you. Don't sit down. I need you. <laughs> but it's amazing. And it brought to my mind the passage of scripture where, where Paul said in Romans, for even their women did forsake the natural use of the man doing that which was unseemly. What I want to stress is that Paul says even their women. What's the point there? In most cultures and in most societies and certainly ours, the women are the last line of defense. The last line of defense. The vanguard for morality are the women. The men break long before the women. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Paul said the men exchange the glory of the incorruptible God into that which is against nature, all kind of stuff. Right. And, uh, and where would the church be without our women? Right. 
Oh yeah, you know I'm telling the truth. Nine times out of ten, if the family is abandoned, dad left. The woman don't leave her children. In most cases. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He can have a litter all over time. But she is going to stay with them children. It is so, it is so common that all black athletes, you're almost shocked when one of them say, hi, dad. Whether they win the Heisman or whatever, it's mom, mom. Run a touchdown. You can't even hear their voices uh, on, the, on the tube, but you, you can read their lips. Always mom. You know why? Dad's been gone. Then when you get that big NFL uh, uh, career, uh, contract, the phone rang. Him. Hey, son. This is your daddy. <laughs> I should have got that call seven, eight, 18 years ago. But it said, even their women, when women began to march, for things like they marched for yesterday. That's an indication that our society is in trouble. Yes, sir. And it is incumbent upon you, the godly women, to stand your ground, to let your voices be heard, to be women of God indeed, to get saved and do right. You gotta do it for love of God, for love of family, and for love of your country, love of community. We need strong, godly women. We need strong, godly men who are saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and have the courage of their conviction. I'm preaching good. Anti-Christian forces. Let me preach so you get out of your way since you don't act like you want to hear it. Anti-Christian forces will grow in strength. Listen to this. Difficulties should never be excuses for missing church services. Now, this is probably one of the most honest moments I've had because I got three amens. And that's honest. Because some of us let anything keep us out of church. <laughs> Pastor, I didn't show up. What happened? My nose was running. <coughs> I had a cough. Monday, all out there on 40. <coughs> Coughing all over the road, but going to work. Make everybody in the office sick. But you're going then, see. But it takes little or nothing to keep you out of church. This is not honoring God. Do you hear me? Difficulties should never be excuses for missing services. Rather, as difficulties arise, and they will, we should make an even greater effort to be faithful in attendance. The tougher the times get, the more determined you should be. I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be. I'm coming. I'm going. I'm going to serve my Lord. You should never want to be known as an abstainer. Some of us are more known. We have a greater reputation for not being here than we do for being here. Absence is our hallmark. The Hebrew writer was concerned about the abstainers. People were abstaining from church because in associating with the church, they were identifying with Christ. Many of the abstainers no longer wanted to be identified with Jesus. So they stayed 
away from his house. That makes sense. I don't want to be identified with the club anymore. That's why I hadn't been. I used to go to the Mac Lounge until the Lord saved me. Amen. I could, I could, I could go to the Mac blindfolded. And I was big for my age so I could get in. You know, they, they asked for ID, but you know, back in Rockingham, <laughs> nobody enforced it. You get that little stamp on your hand going in there, party all night. Amen. <laughs> but when the Lord saved me, I no longer wanted to be identified with that crowd. Are you with me? According to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the Bible says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. Conversely, Jude verse 19 says this concerning the false interpreters of Scripture. He says, these are they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. How you attend church speaks, my friends, to where you are spiritually. You can't be deep in the Lord, strong in the Lord, and mighty in the scriptures, and barely attend church. We're not allowed to write our own rules. Amen. Paul was a churchgoer. The early disciples went to church. Throughout history, people attended who were saved. Even, even lost people attended church. But I'm speaking from a standpoint that when you get saved and washed in the blood, you ought to be in church. You know, some funerals, you know what you do? You actually, you inconvenience the deceased. Because all while they live, they weren't comfortable going to church. And then die, and there's the body at church. The deceased is inconvenienced. Because if you were uncomfortable here, while you were living, you're uncomfortable now. <laughs> that you're dead. <laughs> a Bonner report, and this is a recent report, the State of the Church, 2016. I'm going to preach hard. I'm going to ready to drive in a moment. He shed some light on this subject. The report or the research released in Faith and Christianity, and this was released on uh, September the 15th, 2016. So this is, these are recent numbers. The good news is that there are more churched Americans than unchurched. 56% churched, 45% unchurched. That is still a high number of unchurched. But at least we still at this point have more churched than in unchurched. Current trends continue. That number is going to flip. Churched adults are active churchgoers who have attended a church service with varying frequencies within the last six months. This does not include weddings or a funeral. So for Bonner, the church are those who have attended a service or services in varying degrees over the last six months. Unchurched adults, on the other hand, have not attended a service in the past six months. They may be de-churched, meaning they once attended regularly, or poor or purely unchurched, which means they've never been involved in a Christian faith community. The de-churched backslid. 
The unchurched have never been a part of a church. Under these definitions, a slight majority of adults, 55% are churched. Though the country is almost evenly split with 45% qualifying as unchurched. Help us, Lord. Now, bear with me now, but concerning how Americans affiliate themselves, 73% of Americans identify as Christians. 20% claim no faith at all. That includes atheists and agnostics. The atheists believe there's no God. The agnostics don't know. 6% of Americans Claim to be, claim Islam, Buddhism, Judaism, and Hinduism. And 1% are not sure what they are. Concerning church attendance, even though a majority of Americans identify as Christians and say religious faith is very important in their life, these huge proportions, that 70 3% belie the much smaller number of Americans who regularly practice their faith. When a variable like church attendance is added to the mix, a majority, 73%, becomes a minority. 73% identify as Christians. But when you throw in, well, how many of you go to church? It drops. Oh, my. One of these, one of these, one of these days, I want to preach a message entitled Meaningless Christianity. When a self identified Christian attends a religious service at least once a month and say their faith is very important in their life, Bonner considers that person a practicing Christian. Now you have to admit, Bonner sets the bar mighty low. All you got to do is attend church once a month and say that your faith matters and to Bonner, you are a practicing Christian. That's sad. Praise Lord. We want you to attend more often than that in a week. <laughs> Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.